I'm Ligia Fonseca Coelho. I'm a 51 Pegasi B fellow at the Carl Sagan Institute here at Cornell. Uh, what I do is I sample, I grow, and I measure microorganisms that produce interesting biosignatures that we can use in our exploration and study of exoplanets and icy moons. One of the scientists that inspired me the most was Lynn Margulis, which coincidentally is the first wife of Carl Sagan. Uh, she pushed forward the symbiotic model uh, for the evolution of the cell. Um, and she's a, also a very um, rebellious figure in science. Um, she had to um, overcome a lot as a woman as well with strong ideas at the time. And so she's um, a figure of inspiration for me. What is lovely uh, about working at the Carl Sagan Institute is that no day is exactly the same as the day before. Uh, so I might have a day where I'm in the microbiology lab and then I have to run to the remote sensing lab and do spectro spectroscopy. Um, and then I may spend my summer uh, in the north, in the Arctic, bringing samples here at, uh, to the Carl Sagan Institute. Or I may have a desk day where I'm doing uh, analysis on my data and programming. Um, I may be doing some talks, also some outreach. So no day is the same. I'm Bruce Lewinstein. I teach science communication at Cornell. I'm in the Department of Communication and also in the Department of Science and Technology Studies. I was one of those people who was going to be a scientist as an undergraduate. I was going to be a geophysics major. And then I discovered that actually I wasn't so good at designing experiments. But I knew there was a field called science communication. So I went into science communication. And as it happens, I started uh, my science communication career in the fall of 1980, which is when Cosmos was on the air. So it was, was very much uh, the time with just an explosion of popular science activities. And it was a great time. But it also, after doing it for a few years, I had questions about what role science communication plays in the relationship between science and society. That's, I went back to graduate school. I have a PhD in the history of science. And what I study is the history of public understanding of science Although my definition of history is that if it's happened since you started interviewing me, that counts as history as far as I'm concerned. Carl Sagan was very explicit that imagination plays a key role in science. Uh, one of the famous props of the TV series is the spaceship of, the, of imagination. Uh, and he saw imagination as a tool for how we make progress in science. So I'll probably talk about some of those things. My name is Joshua Yumansky Castro. I'm a six year PhD student here at the Space Systems Design Studio, and I design, build, and fly small spacecraft. The project that I'm working on is really sci fi motivated. It's inspired by um, light sailing to the stars, a uh, concept that Carl Sagan talked about. And this is our, our sail um, and building miniature spacecraft such as chipsets that can drive that sail to new destinations. Being part of CSI and being part of this community at Cornell has been very rewarding. Um, I'm able to work on concepts that were inspired by Carl and, and his legacy. Um, and to bring this sci-fi into reality and test it in space for the first time has been a dream come true. Building a spacecraft has been far more challenging than I ever imagined. There's, there's countless moments where I've designed something and tested something and it's failed and it's failed again and again. And, there's those moments where something works for the first time. And after months and months of failure, I'm, I'm not expecting it, right? I'm, I'm out there in the cold testing some piece of spacecraft hardware, whether it be a solar panel or a GPS antenna, and just waiting for that success. And the moment it comes, is just so exciting and fulfilling um, and brings us one step closer to launch. My name is Mark Sharvari. I'm the director of the Investigative Biology Teaching Laboratories and I'm the founding faculty advisor of the Science Communication and Public Engagement undergraduate minor. Carl Sagan has influenced me very early on during my high school years. I grew up in Hungary behind the Iron Curtain. We did not have the Cosmos series and TV, but I did have a copy of the uh, Dragons of Eden in Hungarian that I read in high school, which completely changed my mind and changed my way I think about evolution and the brain and that really pushed me towards becoming a scientist. You heard about the Sagan effect that Carl Sagan 
was not appreciated as a scientist as much because he did public engagement and he was a, he was the scientist in everybody's living room because of the Cosmos series, but it did negatively affect his scientific career. Now we are hoping that that nowadays undergraduates and students see science communication as part of their role as a scientist. So to be a well-rounded scientist, undergraduates are science communicators as well. They take on a science communicator identity in addition to a scientist identity. So I'm really hoping that the Sagan effect will start to have a positive uh, meaning nowadays when undergraduates and the budding scientists and the next generation of scientists see science communication as something that scientists do and some scientists must do and learn how to do well. My name is Lisa Kaltenegger and I'm the director of the Carl Sagan Institute here at Cornell. You are in Carl Sagan's old office and being here especially inspires me again and again to ask how could we figure out if we are alone in the cosmos? Because those worlds that we find in, circling other stars, they have different kinds of sun in their skies. For example, instead of a yellow one like we have, they are red stars that illuminate these worlds. So how would that change such a world? How would it change biota that could be there? And essentially, could we still spot it with our telescopes? That's really what I'm curious about. And if you just take our own planet and you think about it through time, then the signs of life change so much from when the Earth was young to now. And so we're creating a database of light fingerprint of habitable worlds and of colors and biopigments that could color their surfaces to not miss signs of life in the cosmos. So tomorrow we celebrate Carl Sagan's 90th birthday here at Cornell. Come join us in person, then you get a cupcake and some cider to toast, or on live stream for this celebration. And you'll get to see some of the newest results and adventures in the science of trying to spot life in the cosmos. <laughs>